morning, New Song Church. No, I like to say it twice. Good morning, New Song Church. How are you guys doing? Just say how you guys are doing right now. Put it in the comments. And if you are new, please write that you. This is your, your first time visiting. Let us know that you're there so we're able to get in contact with you. Um, good morning, everybody. I hope you're having a really great Sunday. I hope you're having the best week that you can have. Um, and just get ready to worship with us and um, praise our Lord.
every battle because I know that's yes. where you'll be. Think about that. You'll count the joy in every battle, every circumstance, every yes. trial that you face, in every fire that you're going to be, in every water that you feel like you're drowning and you're not. But you got to count the joy in that because you want to know why you have a Savior. You have a God who loves you, who will never leave you. That's the best thing that we have. In these times, these crazy times, we know better. Because we know that we have a God who has a plan and a purpose for everything. So as you just sit down with us, just really meditate on those words. Because that's real powerful. So today we want to just 
welcome you to New Song Church. If this is your first time here today with us, uh, and you logged in with us, yes, yes, we are so excited. What we want you to do is go to our website, fill out the Connect card, because we want to give back to you. We want you to know that we care, that during this journey, during this battle, we care for you, and we will call you, and we will love you, and we are here for you. Amen. That is so amazing. Um, we're going to continue in our um, offering during this time. Um, you know, God is for you. God loves you. I know many of you might not have a job. Many of you um, might be just going through things. But we're going to lift that up to you, I mean to Jesus. And we're going to believe together because even if we're online or if we're you know, here together as one, we're still together. So we're going to lift that up to Jesus, our offering, and we're going to lift up our prayers to him. So, Father God, we thank you for everything that you're doing, Lord God. Lord, Lord, I, we just are bringing our offering to you, Lord God. Whatever it may be, Lord Jesus, Lord, see our heart, Lord God. Father, many people, many people are without jobs. Lord, but no matter what, we believe that you will never leave us and that you'll never forsake us, Lord. Lord, I ask that you just continue to um, love and that you continue to show that you're right beside and in the storms and in the battles, Lord. But we lift every person up to you, Father. We believe, Lord, that you are with us. Lord, we thank you and we love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. So Pastor Mike's here, and he's going to give you a word. Amen, amen, amen. amen, amen. Come on, come on, come on. Yeah. Woo! Well, live from Castle Hill, here we are. Come on, everybody. Yeah. We are in the Bronx. Listen, let us know where you're from right now. Just say, yeah, we're watching live from Morris Park. We're watching live from Park Chester. We're watching live from Co-op City. Come on, let us know where you're watching. Maybe you're not even in New York. Maybe you're watching from somewhere else. Come on, shout it out loud. Shout it out proud. Let us know where you are. Today is a glorious day. Man, what a great uh, time in the Lord's presence we just had. I just want to take an opportunity to, uh, you know what, just kind of say this. We miss everybody so much, man. We just miss uh, seeing everybody. I want to I wanna just, you know, take this opportunity to let everybody know how much we love you. New song, we will be back together again soon. I know we will in Jesus' name. But in the meantime, we're so glad to be able to be with you today. And we are in a series right now. Uh, we just started it actually last week called Testing Positive, right? Finding Joy in Times of Trouble. And we are going through the book of Philippians. So if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, you know what? Hold it up. Let us know. Hey, I got my Bible. It's a real Bible. Look. Anyway, if you have your iPad or you're using your iPhone, that's okay too. Uh, but turn to the book of Philippians, chapter 1. That's where we're going to be. And just to kind of give you, again, a little, if you missed last week, you can go back on our website. You can watch last week because these are all going to kind of join together. But uh, don't worry, you'll, you'll be able to follow along if, if you missed last week with us. And basically, the Apostle Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit, and he wrote this letter that we call the uh, Book of Philippians in a Roman prison while he was actually chained 24-7 to a, a guard. And what we're learning in this series is that even in the middle of a worldwide pandemic, come on, even in the middle of unhappy circumstances, uh, even in that God is bigger and he's greater than our pain and our problems. And as we just sang, man, he's in there with us. He yes. is in the middle of it. He's in the middle of the fire with us. He's in the middle of the pandemic with us. And no matter how difficult our circumstances might be, we can find joy. Now, this is what I'm talking about. Last week we said there's a difference between happiness and joy. We are not, you know... Um, there's a great movie called The Pursuit of Happiness. It's a great movie, but it's not a great way to live. Because happiness is, is, is we're always pursuing it, but we never can really hold on to it. Because circumstances will always, always turn the other way and kind of bring us down. But when we pursue Jesus, 
We pursue joy because Jesus is joy. I'm going to read to you uh, Philippians chapter 1. Here we go. I hope you have it ready. Chapter 1, verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. Grace to you. Come on, say grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul says this, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, that you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Jesus. And that's the way we feel about you, New Song, right now. How we yearn for each and every one of you. How we want to be with each and every one of you. How when we think back, we remember you and we had joy in our lives because of our church family. Let's pray and we're going to unpack what we just Red Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that is moving in our living rooms. Lord, I pray even as we were singing that the earth would tremble as your presence comes. Lord God, Father, I pray right now, wherever we're watching from, wherever we are, Lord, that your presence, your spirit would fill those rooms, overflow, Lord God. And Lord, that we would find joy today in who you are and that the Joy of the Lord would be our strength. And we thank you in the mighty and awesome name of Jesus. And everybody said... Amen. Amen. Hey, listen. Today's message is called, You're a Work in Progress. You're a work in progress. Come on, high five somebody. Let them know you're a work in progress, right? You're a work in progress. Then look at this guy over here. You're really a work in progress. I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Yeah. But listen, wait, you're a work in progress. Progress And so last week, what we saw was how the gospel transforms us, right? The good news about Jesus transforms us from being a sinner uh, to a saint. And when we turn away from our sin and we ask Jesus to be our Lord, we become part of God's family. Now, we become part of a local church family and you're, you're part of the body of Christ. You're part of the big family, right? All of, all of the believers together. And whenever we say that, right away, some people hear that statement and they think, you know, that's kind of too easy. Like, like um, I must say, I got to do something more to, to really accept Jesus. I have to do something more for my salvation, you know, and, 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 and they'll say, I, I'm not a saint. I, I don't deserve to be called a saint. And I would say to you that, that that's right. You don't deserve it. We can't actually even earn that title. That's why in verse 2, Paul says, grace to you. Before he even says anything else, he's like, I know you don't feel comfortable with that idea of being a saint. So grace, God's grace to you. Now, what is grace? Grace is getting something that you do not deserve. It's like when your kids are acting all kinds of crazy all day long and you're 10 seconds from, come on, laying the smack down, right? It's been a, it's been a long time. It's been a long day, right? And, and, and you're about ready to, to wild on somebody and all of a sudden, what, what do you hear? You hear the glorious sound of Mr. Softy Truck outside. You hear it. Praise God. Hallelujah. And you let them all you let them all have one. Why? Did they, did they deserve it? No, they didn't deserve it. But, but you wanted one. Anyway, that's the truth, right? You really wanted one. So you just let everybody else have one too. And because you love them, even though they don't deserve it, you let them have some ice cream. Listen, that's grace to you. That's God's grace to you. you. We don't deserve to be called saints, but God's given us some ice cream, everybody. Come on, in the pandemic, we can get down with some hot and dumb. Right? We, can, we, can, we, can, we can have some ice cream. We can, we can celebrate. That's God's grace to you. You're a saint, even though you don't feel like it. 
you, that's God's grace, right? For some, for some people, the idea of our salvation being solely dependent on everything that Jesus did, solely dependent on the finished work of the cross, is really hard to accept. And so they, 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 they feel like, I can't be saved by God's grace alone, so i got to do something else to kind of hold on to this salvation, right? To kind of keep this salvation. What do they start doing? They start adding to it. It's like, oh yeah, you need Jesus and you got to do this. You need Jesus and you have to do that, right? And I would say, no, 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 no. That's, that's what is that? That's outside in religion. That's like trying to do something on the outside and trying to get it in here. So you're like, well, if I dress up and I, I say all the right things and I say all the right prayers, right, then I'll be, I, I will be saved. I'm going to hold on to my salvation. Listen, you can't add anything to God's free gift. You can't add anything. It's by grace alone that we are saved. I love what the Apostle Paul actually says in Ephesians. He says, for it's by grace you've been saved through faith, and this faith is not up from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can actually boast about it and say, hey, look at, how, look at all the ice cream I deserve. Look at all the grace that I should be getting. I'm a saint, right? So you may be recently saved, or you may be actually saved for quite a while now, and you're kind of walking this walk with God, but most days you really don't feel like a saint. Let's be honest. Most days you kind of like, you're having a hard time seeing yourself in the new identity that God sees you in Christ. And you know what? What happens is the devil starts working overtime in your mind. He starts condemning you, accusing you, shaming you. And, and listen, this is why the Apostle Paul not only says grace to you, but he says God's peace to you. Because when we are not feeling it, right, when God's grace always has to come first, but the people, people need peace. People are looking for peace right now, but they never truly find peace until they find Christ. Christ is the prince of peace. And so God's grace to you, God's Peace, the peace of God to you. It lets us know. It lets us know that man, we don't deserve to be this this saint. And when I trip up, when I mess up, the peace of God comes upon me. Let him know he's not throwing you away. He's not angry with you. You you haven't just committed the the unpardonable sin. He's he's with you, man. When we accept the grace of God, we get a supernatural peace from God that lets us know that we belong to. Him. And listen to me. I know you don't feel like a saint. I know you don't feel like a saint. Most of the time, you would say, I don't feel like that. But God's at work in your heart right now. If you're following Jesus, if, you, if, you're, if you're a believer, if you're working, you're, 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 you're walking with him, right? Then God is at work in your heart right now. And so as we as we cooperate with the Holy Spirit who lives inside us, we start to see victory. We just say, I'm going to see a victory. How do you see that victory? It's not by what you do. It's by what Jesus has already done in us. God's grace, God's peace. We're going to see the victory in our lives. And where we were once a slave to sin, where we were once in bondage, where we were once uh, you know, held captive, by the enemy, by sin, by death, by all those things. We find joy now in life. We, find, we rejoice now in our salvation. Man, we, when was the last time you rejoiced in your salvation? When was the last time you were just like, wow, thank God, thank you, Lord, that, that this, this isn't all there is, and then I die. No, you know, it's like you're rejoicing in everything that God has done for us, and we find joy. We're being transformed from the what? Inside of us, out, not the outside in, but from the inside out, we're being transformed by Jesus. And this is what Paul's talking about. Even when we don't realize it, even when our circumstances are bad, we can find joy that God is at work, even when we don't see it, even when we don't believe it, even when we doubt it, even in the middle of a pandemic, even right now, as you're looking at me like, I don't think that's true, right? I'm telling you it's true. God is at work, and, and I'm going to break this down to you. There's three ways that, that Paul just lets us know. Three ways, right now, one, two, three. Three ways that you, that God is at work. And the first one for your notes, write this down. Come on, I know you can do it. Write it down. God is at work around you. 
God is at work around you. Listen to what Paul says. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership. Partnership. What? Everybody working together, right? Church, family, everybody working together. God is at work around you in the partnership of the good news about Jesus, of the gospel. From the first day. What was that first day? We talked about that last week. From the first day until now. And so what we see here is that Paul's the founding pastor of the church in Philippi. He personally led some of them to Jesus. He water baptized them. He, he's invested them and he knows their past. He knows how jacked up they were, right? He understands how their lives were all entangled. And man, isn't that the way you are and the way I am? Like you come to Jesus and your life is all tangled up. Like, like, I don't know if, if you're any, if there's fishermen out there, you know, when your fishing line gets all tangled up and you just kind of, kind of cut it and, and move on, that's kind of like the way it is for us. Our lives are all kind of messed up and tangled up and God comes and he saves us and what's he start to do? He starts to untangle us. He starts to, he starts to move us. He starts to shake us, right? And, and so Paul sees, he knows the victories that they had. He knows their struggles, but he also knows their victories. And he's sitting in a Roman jail and, and he's got all this time to think. He's thinking about all different kinds of things. In fact, he wrote a bunch of letters, not just this one. He wrote a bunch of letters while he's got time to think. And so he's, his mind starts to think back at the church in Philippi, the church that he started. He didn't even want to be there. He didn't even know why he was there. And yet God opened up all these doors, and he, he, was, and he starts reflecting back, and he thinks about this girl named Lydia. We met her last week. Thinks about Lydia. She's a rich Asian fashionista, baby, right? She, she's a CEO. She's a boss. She's a boss, right? She, she could actually be on that show, You're Fired. Like, she could fire somebody, all right? Like, she's that. She's, she's like that, right? And, and she's, she's the only woman at an at a all-women Bible study that actually gets saved, you know? Paul comes and he preaches the gospel. She's the only one. And how she actually opened her home to Paul and his launch team of pastors that are there. She not only opened her home, she actually helped to finance it. Come on, somebody. Like, she's just, she's like, oh, you guys need, some, need a building? Let's go, right? And so she just, she was just all in, in the work. Paul thinks back to the Greek slave girl. Remember her? We talked about her last week, too. She's demon-possessed. She was worth nothing to society. She was actually used and exploited. You know, people are making money off of her, and her owners are just, are just using her and abusing her, and she comes to Christ, and Paul's thinking back to the Roman jailer because when Paul prayed for her and cast that demon out, he got beat down him and his team, they get beat down, and Silas and Paul end up in jail, and there's a Roman jailer there, and he, this guy's like XGI, you ever meet those, like, thank you XGI guys, right, usually those, you guys are, are, are like no-nonsense guys, I'm, I'm just saying, you're like, you're, 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 you're a man of duty, you're a woman of duty, you, you're, you, um, you're serious, right? You're serious. And so this guy took his job seriously, literally tortures Paul and, and Silas, like puts him in all kinds of crazy contortion and then locks him and keeps him there. That's what they would do. It was part of his job. And he did his job well. And so when Paul's writing this letter, he's thinking back and he's, he's saying, he's saying, I remember you because of your partnership from the first day, from those days until now, man, you've been in this. And he starts thinking about how God was at work in each of their lives. Like, they didn't, they, they were still all just knotted up at how God began to work in their lives. How the gospel brought them together as a church family. And how they were all now partners in the gospel. New Song Church, listen to me. This is our story too. And it's every other church's story. How God is at work around us. Even when we don't see it, God is moving in the hearts of of, of people all around you. And Jesus Christ, even in the middle of a pandemic, is building his church. The church has never stopped. It's just actually now moved into homes. We all got a home church now, right? I mean, God is still 
still moving. God is still working. God, people are still accepting Christ as Lord and Savior. The gospel is still going out. We're still worshiping together. The Holy Spirit's not bound by our walls, right? He's not bound by social media. He is, he's, he is moving and he's working even when we don't see it, even when we don't feel it. Church isn't just a place you go. It's a family you belong to. And if you belong to New Song right now, come on, come on, come on. Just yeah. celebrate that. Celebrate. Oh, I wish I could hear your amens. But shout it out so I can hear it. Shout it out so I can hear it from Castle Hill, wherever you are. Amen, Pastor Mike. Wave me down, flag me down, dance around, whatever you got to do. Let me know that you're with me. God is moving. And we see this. We see this even in the book of Acts. Let me just kind of take it back for a second. We see how God is working around us. Even in the books, book of Acts, from the very first day that the church is really like born and the, the Holy Spirit comes down and uh, the, the, the 120 that are in the upper room in Acts chapter 2 are baptized in the Holy Spirit and they begin preaching the gospel boldly and Peter stands up. And he starts preaching, man, and get this, to over 3,000 people he's preaching. And in chapter uh, 2 of verse 41, those who believe that Peter said, uh, what Peter said, were baptized and added to the church. You see, God's at work in people's hearts, and, and God is still adding to the church. On that day, about 3,000 people got saved. All the believer, believers, what they do, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. Verse 46, they worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in their homes. Hey! They met in their homes. That's what we're doing right now. For the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, I love this, each day, every single day, doesn't matter if it's in the middle of a pandemic, God was adding to the church. God was, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Man, listen, anytime the gospel's going out, anytime the word is being preached, people are receiving that. People, they, they're convicted of their sin, right? They realize why they need a Savior. They repent of their sin. They turn to Jesus. And God begins to build a community around that that becomes the local church. New song. You are part of that story. You're part of that story. You, we're, we're together. This is why we need each other. This is why we need to be part of a local congregation, a local body. This is why you need a church family. I'm talking to somebody right now. This is why you need a church family. You know what? After this is all over, we're probably going to continue to, to extend this and, and live stream it. But listen, you need a church family. You got to, you can't just go to bedside Baptist. Come on, somebody, you know what I'm saying? You can't just roll out of bed and put your slippers on and turn on Stephen Furtick, turn on T.D. Jakes, turn on some of these great preachers, right? And, and, and just say, well, I got it. No, 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 listen, listen, listen. You need more than that. You need fellowship. You need growth. You need, you need to be encouraged. And you need a place where you can use your gifts and your talents. God is at work around you and he's building his church and the gates of hell will not stand against it. I wish I get somebody to understand what I'm saying right now because I'm preaching good. I, I, I know I, I, I can feel it. I can feel it. This is why you need, this is why you need a church family. Listen, it took a long time. When I finally got saved, and Pastor Cindy, we finally got saved, it took us a long time to get involved in the church family. Longer than we should have. And maybe that's where you are today. It took longer, it took long time, almost five years for us to finally get involved in church. Like we were there, and then we would take six weeks off. Come on, somebody. Well, what was it? Well, we had, you know, you had Mother's Day, then you had Father's Day, and then you had birthdays, and everything's on Sunday, right? And so, so what would we do? We would put anything and everything over our schedule to worship Jesus together, to get involved. And here's what happened. Here's what happened. We stayed very, very much like um, baby Christians. 
right? We, we didn't grow. We, we didn't know anything about God. We, we, we were just like, hey, we're going to heaven someday, right? I mean, we didn't know. Maybe that's where you are today. And there's no offense to that, but you need to grow. You, you need to grow in your faith. And this is why, come and listen, when, when we started to get engaged in church, when we just started, you know what? We're not going to miss a Sunday. I mean, there, there's, there comes a time where you just got to be like, I'm not going to miss a Sunday. And you'll probably end up hitting at least two out of the four. Come on. Just like you say, I'm not going to miss a gym day. And you still miss like four out of the six. Right? It's just the way it is. It's like who we are. I know I'm preaching to somebody right now, right? Put the hog and dolls down, baby, and do some burpees later. Let's go. Come on. We can do this. It's a pandemic, but we can do this anyway. Listen, it was when, when we started to go to church together, that's when we began to learn about God. We began to actually know God, like learn about God. Listen to what happened in Acts chapter 2. Again, all the believers, what did they do? They devoted themselves to the Lord's teaching. Listen, there's things that you need to know about God that you do not know about God yet. And when we come together, you, you can't just live like Jesus for, and live for Jesus if you don't know how to do it. How do I do it? How do I do it? One of the wonderful things about the word being preached in a family setting, in a congregation, is that we learn. We learn from his word. We come together on Sunday to learn from the word of God. But we all don't just learn to, about God. We learn how to love other people. We learn how to love God. We learn how to love other people. What do they do? The scripture says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship. I love that. We don't have to, we don't just develop a vertical relationship with God. We also, as the Holy Spirit's working in us, we develop a horizontal relationship with each other. We begin the process of knowing what it looks like to love other people. And you really know that when you begin to serve other people. You know that, that that's working in there. We begin to share life together. We begin to actually have each other over when we can. To each other's houses, right? We let our walls down a little bit. We share a little bit. Right now, we're unable to physically come together. We can't do that. We can't come together for life groups right now in, in a physical fashion. We can't come together on Sunday morning for all of us to be there. But man, what a day it's going to be. It's going to be amazing. We're probably just going to dance and party all night long. I mean, we're just going to be like, let's get some food. Let's have some worship. Let's do it again, right? Oh, Lord, do it again. We're going to eat some more. We're going to dance some more. We're going to pray some more. We're going to celebrate. Oh, it's going to be great. I have no idea what it, when it's going to be, but I know it's going to be awesome when it gets here. But but until then, listen, this is we need this. But there's a fellowship that's beyond that. And we also learn to partner, man. We learn to partner in the gospel. That's what Paul says. The Lord added to their fellowship. They were partnering in the gospel. As we learn to love God and love others, his plans become our plans. It doesn't happen overnight. His agenda becomes our agenda. God uses you and he uses me. And all of our problems and our past mistakes, he turns them around to help other people. And, and, and others find Jesus. I'm going to break that down in a second. But we tell others our personal story of how Jesus saved us and, and how he delivered us. And then they know, and they hear, and they accept Jesus. And that's what's been going on for over 2,000 years. The church cannot be stopped, but we need each other. We need each other. I don't want you to learn from my, or I want you to learn from my bad mistake, man. It took me five years to get connected. That's five years of spiritual growth that I didn't get. That's every time we walked through the door, the greeters gave us a brand new greeter thing. I mean, that's, they, they didn't even recognize us, right? Like, we had a family of seven. How are you not recognizing a family of seven walking through the doors? But it wasn't on their, it, it, was, it wasn't on them, it was on us. Because we were only there like once every couple of months. Come on. It wasn't, it wasn't their fault. It wasn't the church's fault that we were growing. It wasn't God's fault that we were growing. Can I just say something? It was my fault. Because I put other things, uh, other things were more important than that. But did that mean that God stopped loving me? No. Did that mean that God stopped working around me? No. God is at work. God was still building his church even when I wasn't there. Come on. God's building his church. Even when you don't go, God's going to still build his church. That's not going to stop. So God is at work around you. Church family, we got to remember that. 
church family. Point number two, write it down. Come on, write it down. God is at work in you. Man, this is my favorite part. This, this is where we, we, we don't believe this. We really don't believe this. We really believe that God's really at work in us if I'm doing something for him. Now, we get that, again, that kind of goes back to that outside-in mentality of religion. You know, if I really love God, I have to stand outside of the six train with my watchtowers and show everybody how much I love God, right? I have to, I have to do, I got to knock on doors, I got I to gotta stand on the corner, on the four train, up there, and just preach with a mega, megaphone in English and Spanish, and, and let everybody know they're going to hell. By the way, hey, have a nice day, you're going to hell. Hey, you're on the right. You're going to hell. Hey, you're over there with the Giants jersey. Yeah, I'm a Jets fan. Going to hell. I'm really not. I'm a Giants fan, but you know what I'm saying. All the Jets fans got excited for a second. But anyway, God is at work in you, and you need to believe that. And this is what Paul says, and this is one, this is one of those, remember I said last week there's some verses that are verses you want to memorize? This is one of them. Verse 6, Philippians 1, 6. And I am sure of this. Some of your translations say, I am confident in this. Like, I know this is definite for you as a follower of Jesus. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to remember something. In its context, who's Paul writing to? Paul's, Paul's writing, and he's thinking back when he says, that he who began a good work in you, he's thinking of real people. He's got real people on his mind. He doesn't necessarily have you on his mind, although God does. And Paul's inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so when we read this, we can also apply it to us. But we remember that Paul's actually thinking back to Lydia. And he's actually thinking back to the slave girl. And he's actually thinking back to the jailer. And this is one of those places you know, he who began a good work in you, Lydia, he who began a good work in you, unnamed slave girl, he who, who get, began a good work in you, unnamed jailer, will complete it. And here's what you and I do. I mean, I do it, and I'm assuming you probably do it too. When we read in the scriptures, we read in the scriptures when people get saved, right? And, and when we see that they're just, they're, they're, they're miraculously uh, delivered, we think that they never ever actually struggled with anything again. It was like, man, they get saved and they walked around on a glory cloud the rest of the time. They got saved and they always got a parking spot for their chariot. They got saved and they, and they always had free babysitting. They got saved and no pandemics ever happened. Nothing bad ever happened. They were completely saints from the beginning. They never sinned again. They never cursed when they were stuck in traffic, right, while listening to worship music, come on. They never did any of those things. They didn't watch rated R movies. Of course, they didn't have rated R movies, but you understand. They didn't have movies. They, you understand what I'm saying. We think that they went from sinner to saint automatically. But can I just suggest something to you? That they're just like, oh, they're real people, just like we're real people. And when we come to know Jesus, we got some junk in our trunk, you know what I'm saying? We got some stuff going on, like we got some skeletons in our closet. However you want to think about it, there's still some junk there inside of our lives that needs to be worked out. It needs to be out, right? It needs to like get out, you know what I'm saying? And so, and, and, and it's, a, it's a process, but I mean, this is... This is what's going on. So, you know, I'm just speculating here. Paul doesn't say anything. Luke doesn't say anything. But let's just think for a second what you and I struggle with and connect them to Lydia, the slave girl, and the jailer. What, do you think that it's possible that maybe because Lydia was very, very wealthy and she's a CEO and she has like a CEO attitude about certain things, you think that maybe she was a control freak? You think that maybe when... They're trying to set up the church. She's like, well, I don't know if I like that idea. And, and she was like, you know, maybe she struggled a little bit. Is it possible that, that in her early walk with Jesus, she wanted everything her way or no way at all because of, because of who she is? Is it possible? Is it possible that maybe she, from time to time, struggled with pride? Like, I am the financer of the church in Philippi. I mean, you know, shouldn't I at least get a front row seat? You know? 
I am a deacon. I am a worship. I'm a worship leader. I'm on the worship team. Hello. I am a prayer warrior. Shouldn't I at least get? I teach the Bible. Shouldn't I at least? That's the. What is that? That's pride. That's like. That's like. That's like pride. Just kind of like ooh, coming, coming out, right? And and and, and is it possible that she she might have struggled with that? Maybe, maybe. What about the slave girl? Is it possible? Just think about this. The Bible doesn't tell us. This is all speculation, but think about this. Is it, is it possible that the slave girl struggled with bitterness? Is it possible that the slave girl had unforgiveness and anger in her heart for whoever, maybe her parents, maybe somebody else, sold her into slavery? Is it possible that she struggled as, as she learned that Jesus wanted you to turn the other cheek? Is it possible that she struggled with those that abused her? That used her? That took advantage of her? Do you think that maybe she had relationship problems after this? Particularly when it came to men? Do you think that maybe she struggled with those things? I think it's, it's possible. What about the jailer? I mean, do you think that the jailer who was like this ex- military guy might have needed the Lord's help in softening him up a little bit. Like you can't treat everybody like you're storming the beaches. You know what I'm saying? You can't treat your kids like you're in the middle of a war. Everybody line up. Let's go. Come on. Ah! And, you're, and you're just, right. Was it possible that he needed a little bit more compassion when he spoke to his wife? A little bit mercy when he was talking with other people? It wasn't just, let's just wipe them out and they keep moving. No, 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 no. Was it, it, did, did God have to do so maybe there was some work. Maybe God was shaving off some of the edges to get him to be more like Christ. Maybe God, whatever sins or pains or problems that these guys had, they still, just like you and I, had to grow in Christ just like we do. Jesus needed to work in them just like he has to work in us. So you got some sin issues, right? I'm just saying. I'm not pointing my finger because I, I do too, right? We have issues. We have problems. We have pains. And, 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 and they try to steal our joy. And Paul says that I know for sure. I'm confident in this, that he who began a good work in you. I want to stop right there. Circle that word, he. Who is it that began the good work? Who is it? His name is Jesus. Who is it? His name is God, right? He's Jesus. Jesus is the one that started the good work. Not your pastor. Paul didn't start a good work in these guys. Paul didn't do anything except preach the gospel. He did what he was supposed to do. But when the gospel goes out and a heart receives it and repents and turns, the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us. He's the one that begins right then the work. He begins a good work at that moment. If you're a follower of Christ, you had an at-that-moment experience. You know what that means. Jesus just, he just came in, right? And so he who began the good work in you, he who began the good work in Lydia, he who began the good work in the slave girl, he who began the good work in the jailer, will take, he will complete it, right? He who began the good work. It's God who's doing a work in you. God is at work in you. I love what Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says, for we are God's handiwork. Some of your, some of your uh, translations say masterpiece. I love that. You right now are God's masterpiece. You are his handiwork. Created what? In Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are God's work of art. He's the potter. He's the potter. We're the clay. He's the, he's the artist. We're the canvas. He's, he, he's at work in us. But notice something else. His work in us is a process. It's a process. I wish that it was like, bang, you're just like Jesus. 
Bang, you're like Jesus. Bang, you're like Jesus. I wish I could do that. If I could do that, I would run down the six train slapping people. You're like Jesus. You're like Jesus. You're like Jesus. I would, I would go, oh, I'm not slapping people for Jesus. I would love to slap people for Jesus. I'm just kidding. Anyway, listen, this is this is what, what he's doing, right? He he's the he's the potter, we're the clay. But notice what Paul says. He who began a good work. That means this implies that he began it and he's still doing it. If he began something, he's actually still at work in you. Think back to when you first surrendered your life to Jesus. At that moment, God begins to work in you, but here's how it all plays out. You still struggle with stuff. You, 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 still, you still got problems. You, you walk away from the altar, you still got pains. You still got problems. You still got issues, right? You still got imperfections. And you're like, I don't feel much like a masterpiece. I don't feel like a priceless work of art. I feel, I feel like a lump of clay. That's what, you know, I feel like, ugh. Like, 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 yeah. I felt great at the altar, then I get home, I'm like, ugh. I still got all this work to do. To do. And, and, and yet you look around, you see other people, they're not struggling with the same things you're struggling with. They're not doing the same things you're doing. They're not thinking the same thoughts you're thinking. They're not watching the same things you're watching, right? And you're like beating yourself up. Like, I thought God was at work in me, right? You get frustrated. The devil starts to condemn you. But you, what you're failing to understand is God, even though you don't see it, is still at work inside of you. It would be like this. You walk into the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Have you ever gone to the, into the the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's pretty fun, it's pretty fascinating, but here's the deal. Like, I've walked through that place, and I've looked at some of the things that are priceless works of art, and I'm like, I don't get it. Now, again, I'm not an artist, I can't, I can't even draw stick people, but they're, seriously, a can of soup? It's a can of soup. Okay. I feel like I could make a can of soup. I should have maybe thought about making a can of soup. Right? But, but somebody considers that priceless work of art. It's, it's priceless. Now think about this scenario for a second. If I were to go in and be, as, as the artist is starting to, do you ever see those other arts where, where there's just like sprinkles? I love those ones because it almost was like the artist just went, shh, shh, shh. beautiful. You see it? You see it? You see it? I'd be like, I don't see it. And I don't get it. Do you remember those things in the, in the early 90s, like those pictures where if you stared at it long enough, like a picture would come to you? I would stare like that with my eyes like... Literally, I remember going into the malls and people, there was gallery in the mall with all this 3D art and everybody would be like this. Seriously, they'd, they'd be staring at this thing. I would walk up behind them and I'm like... I don't get, I'm sorry, I don't have an artistic eye, right? So if like, if, if one of these masterpiece artists, these guys, you know, Picasso, if Picasso was in front of me and he starts doing his Picasso thing, whatever it is, right, he's dabbling, he'd be like, you see that? You see that? You know, I can just kind of picture him with like the, the beret and everything. You, you see that? There's a happy little tree over here, right? You're like, this doesn't look like a tree. It looks like fluff. It looks like, it looks like, but, but here's the deal. What I see is a work in progress. He's not done yet, right? And some of us, what, what, what it is is that we're actually a blank canvas and you're looking at the couple of dots. You're looking at a couple of the areas in your life and you're like, I don't see a masterpiece. But listen to me, it's because God is still at work in you. God is still working. He's still working it out. He's still painting. You're just seeing things in the early stages. You're just seeing the little dots on the thing and you're trying to say, God's not at work. You and I are a work in progress. God's not done with us yet. Come on, get Give me some praise. Give God some praise. Don't give me praise. But give me a clap. Give me some thumbs up. Let me know that, that, that this is true for you as much as it is for me. And because becoming like Jesus, because, because this process of becoming like Jesus requires me to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. It, it just reminds it, 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 me. We have to cooperate and surrender to God's best for our life. And listen, God's got a better plan for your life than you do. If you don't believe that, think about last year. Think about all the plans you had, all the great ideas you had, all the decisions you made. I think God's got bigger ones. I think he's got better ones. I think he's got ones that will help you out 
And so this is this is this is the 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 the, uh, the process of becoming like Jesus, he who began a good work in you. God's at work inside of us. And we call this the process, now it's a big word, of sanctification. Sanctification. The process of sanctification, it's becoming more and more like Jesus. Being molded into the image of Jesus. He who began a good work in you. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's not a sprint. Family, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's a long distance run. It's not, it's not a sprint. It's not instantaneous. Your salvation is instantaneous. Right? That's there. That's sealed. That's delivered. But listen, work, becoming more like Jesus, working it out, that's, that's a process. And our job is just to keep running. He who begins this work, God's at work inside of you, listen, before he starts to shine through you. And some of you are feeling real cloudy. You feel real cloudy. And you're wondering, when is God going to, listen, just keep listening, keep surrendering, keep obeying, keep, as the Holy Spirit says stuff, you just keep moving. It's sad that some people think that holiness is all about what you see on the outside. It's not. It's about what happens on the inside, way before it happens on the outside. But I want you to remember this. Even in this process, some of you are, 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 are really tangled up right now. Listen, even in this process, God, I want you to remember, God loves you. He's for you. He's working in you. And as you surrender to him, he starts taking off those rough edges. He starts sanding down. He starts molding you. He starts painting. He's making you and he's turning you into uh, a, um, a masterpiece. You're becoming more like Jesus. Now, all I have is my own thoughts and my own stories on how God did this with me. And I would be here all day because God's still doing this in me. You know, can I get an amen? But listen, when, when I first came to Christ, there were certain things that God began to shave off of my character right away. There were certain things, and I've told this story before, but there were certain things that, that, that he would, he, first of all, I had a, re a really bad mouth. I, I swore all the time, or I cursed all the time. It depends on what part of the country you're in. You cussed, you cursed, you swore. It all means the same thing. So whether you cuss, you curse, because I'm speaking to people all over the country right now. You're cussing, you're cursing, or you're swearing, okay? So however, however it plays out, I had a bad mouth. I, I, I loved the F word. I'm just saying it. Can I, can I be real with you today? Oh, shut the club, turn off the kids' ears. I, ha I used to say the F word. Yeah. Yeah. And it wasn't faith. All right? It was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was other, it was other. I'm getting, I'm getting this from my life. Okay, okay. You understand. You understand. I, I, and, and one of the things that the Holy Spirit began to work on right away was my mouth. Maybe that was you. Maybe for you it was something else. For me, it was my mouth. And I was a union steward, man. No offense to union stewards, but, you, but union stewards know how to curse. You know what I'm saying? Union stewards, it's almost like it's got to be part of the thing. Like, you got to be able to curse at the company guy and let him know that this isn't going to go down. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to pull out the big guns. You know, I'm Italian. This is what we do. We talk with our hands, you know? And, and so this is, this is kind of how it was for me. And I remember as the Holy Spirit was working in me, every time it came out, oh, my gosh, it was like, it was like, like my heart was just like, like an arrow to my heart. It was almost like when, you, when you're a kid and you do something wrong and daddy goes. And it's not like I'm going to throw you out. I'm going to squash you like a bug. It's just like you know you can't. You shouldn't do that. Now stop that. That's not good. I don't want you to do that. What is it for you? What is it for you? I remember literally. That God was taking certain things, not just that, but he was moving things in my life. Listen, there were areas in my life that, that just needed to go. It, they were unchristlike. I'm not going to bore you with the details, but this is what I did. This is an honest to God, true story. What I did was I began collecting certain things, music that, that God said I shouldn't listen to. Again, that's not, I'm not putting my stuff on you. God may say you can listen to that. For me, it was no good. And so there were certain things I did, and what I did was I put them all in a box one day. And I had this box, and I had the box, and I 
head down in my basement of my house for the longest time. And, and every once in a while, I would walk down the stairs, right? I'd walk down the stairs and I'd look in my box. I literally would look in my box. I'd be like, oh yeah, look at this. I love that. Oh, I love. I love that movie. Right? I love that book. Oh my gosh! I love, right? And it was almost like I had a love affair with the box. Now, all the while, the Holy Spirit saying, "Get rid of the box, man. Just dump the box. Just let go of the box. Like I got something better for you." But I was too busy admiring what God was asking me to give give up. Right? I was too busy thinking I'm going to miss out on something that I was missing the blessing that God wanted to give me when I decided to let go of the box. Listen to me. Some of you right now, it's time to let go of the box. It's time to get rid of the box. It's time to bury the box. It's time, if the Holy Spirit is saying it, that's God working in you. And here's what helped me. Instead of saying no, <laughs> instead of just saying no when he says, no, I'm not going to do that, God. I'm not going to give it, give that up. Instead of saying, well, maybe, let me think about it. I'm going to pray on it, God. I'm going to pray on this and see if this is really you, you know? We do that. Or instead of saying no or maybe, or this one is, um, I'll get back to you, God. I'm going to get back to you. I'll let you know. I'm going to think about that, right? Instead of doing those things, I started to become more like Jesus, right? Become more Christ-like when I said yes. Can you try that right now? Yes. Yes. It's just, just yes. God, yes. With your help, God, yes. Why? Because becoming like Jesus requires that you and I cooperate with him. Becoming like Jesus requires that, that we would cooperate with the Holy Spirit. And sanctification is the process. It's not a marathon. And, 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 and start with little things. God will say, will you, will you start to read my word? Say, yes, God. And then today, go find a, plan, find a Bible plan. Yes, God, I'm going to start today. Even if it's just one verse a day, I'm going to start. Will you start to consistently attend church? Yes, God. I'm going to consistent, consistently do that. I'm going to give you the first part of, of my week every week. I'm going to consistently. Will you begin to, would you, maybe for you, it's will you get in a life group? Would you please get in a life group? Would you please get connected? Yes, God, I'm going to do that. Will you begin to serve? Yes, God. Whatever it is, I'm challenging you to, in this process, to get rid of your box and to say, yes, God. You, you may be sitting there thinking to yourself, yeah, I'm glad God's at work in you, Mike, but uh, I've got a long way to go. <laughs> I've got a long way to go. Like, God's working on much bigger things with me. Listen, it may be one thing for you, it may be one thing for me, but whatever it is, I would just say, f find joy and comfort that God loves you, he's working in you, and he's asking you to surrender something. And when you do that, you begin to grow in Jesus. Now, now this, is, this is just kind of coming here. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. I want you to hear that. He who started this work, you're a work in progress. He who began this work, he's going to finish what he started. I love the song. I know how the story ends. Listen, I know how this story ends. You want to know how this story ends? This story ends with us celebrating the victory of Jesus, right? This story ends with God completing everything in you that he set out to do. It may be a slow work, but it's a guaranteed work. Whatever God starts, he finishes. God's not a quitter like you and I are. God isn't going to get frustrated one day. You know what? That's it. I'm done with you. I've been telling you to get moving all these years, and I am done. I am D-O-N-E, done, or if you're from down south, done, D-U-N. It doesn't matter where you're from. He's just, done. no, that's not what God does. That's not how God works. God doesn't do that with us the way that we do that with other people. God's in it to win it. And he's already got the victory. He's waiting for you patiently, loving you, gracefully, giving you peace that surpasses all understanding so that you can become like his son. He is going to make you more like Jesus and he's going to continue it. When? Until you see Jesus. Either Jesus comes back or you go back to be with him. Whichever comes first. When that happens, he has completed the work. God's at work in you. Or God's at work around you. God's at work in you. And for my last point, thank God, Lord have mercy. God 
is at work through you. Write it down. God's at work through you. Even now, even as jacked up as you are, as tied up as you are, as thinking that you, God can't use somebody like me. Well, God used Moses, who was a murderer, okay? He can use, God used Paul, who was a murderer, all right? God used a donkey. He can use you. He can use me. God's at work through you. Now, I want to finish this up by pointing out chapter, verses 7 and 8. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I told you in my heart for, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. How do I know that God is starting a good work in me? That might be your question today. How do I know? Like what are the signs? Is there a sign Right? Is there a sign that shows me? Well, I think that God works through us. Personally, I think that he works through us more than we realize. I think that certain things we say, certain things we God, God uses everything. But in this context, to be fair to Philippians and to be fair to the context, Paul gives us two signs that we know, that he's, he's convinced. And so uh, we're partakers in his work. And so he gives us two signs. When you stand up for the gospel, in other words, a defense of it, and when you share the gospel or a confirmation of it, you're confirming it. When you hear someone mocking Jesus you love, the Jesus you love, does that bother you? When you, when, when, when you hear someone misusing Jesus' name, when you hear them using Jesus' name as a curse word, is it something, is it almost like when you're rubbing that, like, like when you hear that, because, you're, because that's your Jesus that, he's, that they're speaking of. That's your Jesus. That they're, you know what? When you see people mocking Jesus, it bothers us, doesn't it? It bothers us. I'm, my wife is famously, she is famous for this. If you're going to misuse the word of Jesus around you, she's going to lovingly ask you. Uh, uh, if you're going to misuse Jesus' name around her, she's going to lovingly ask you to stop. I've seen her done it, do it a million times. She'd be like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, like, you know how, I'm sorry. I know, you know, but could you not, could you not use Jesus' name like that? You see, he's my Lord and he's my Savior. I've seen her do that, and I'd be like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? I'd like, get out of the way. But she's like, why? Because, because that, that's, that, she's, it's, the name is so precious. And so whenever someone starts to, starts to, um, uh, you misuse his name. She stands up. She stands up for the gospel. She stands up for Jesus. She stands up like that. That's, that's, that's what that means. And, and whenever someone starts asking questions about God or faith, you can stand up. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a teacher, right? You, if you didn't love God, then, 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 then you wouldn't want to say anything about God. But when God's when you understand the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the working of God in your life, then you, when somebody asks the question, you're going to want to stand up and say, this is why I love Jesus. It's simple. It's just it's sharing your testimony, right? It's, 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 and, and here's the thing. I'm not, ask, I'm not saying that you need to be, you know, mean. I'm not saying this gives us a license to be snarky. That's a new word I like. Snarky. You don't, you don't have to be rude. You don't have to be arrogant. You don't have to put somebody down. You don't have to, you know, yell in their face. I'm saying that there's spirit-led moments where you're going to stand up for the gospel. And Paul says when you do that, that's a sign that God's at work inside of you. Yeah, that, that, that's a sign. And, and, and the other way is when you share the gospel. When you just begin to share the gospel. When you begin to share your testimony. When you, begin able, when you just, just, just share your faith. Paul says that's confirmation. It means that you're confirming something. You're confirming that, that gospel, that's true. Jesus is real. That what he did is, is true. And here's how this plays out. Every time the gospel is preached, either like today in a church setting where we're listening to the word being, being um, preached, or when you're talking to your best friend, right, about Jesus, however it is, someone receives Jesus, Lord, the gospel is being confirmed. See, look what happened. When you shared your, your, your testimony, look what happened. When you posted that thing about how God helped you and saved you and, and, and protected you or funded you, however it was, look what happened. Somebody took notice. Somebody, the gospel went out, and, and it's going to happen 
today. The message of Jesus is still changing lives in us. And just you just have to share your life-changing experience with Jesus. Pastor Cindy, if you could come. There's, there's a, there's, um, I remember also, you would think that I, I kind of ran out of the gate preaching Jesus, but I didn't. In fact, this, this, this was such a process for me that I, I would not say anything about anything. I would just sit there quiet. Like, I would, I would not say anything. <laughs> And I would watch my wife, who at the time was working at a jail. She was working at a jail. Med nurse at a jail. And she'd come home with all these stories of how, oh my gosh, I was speaking to this woman, and it was like a God moment, man. The Holy Spirit led me, and she gave her life to Jesus. It was awesome. And then her friend, the next day, you know, gave her life to Jesus, and this, and I'm sitting here like, I suck. Like, I can't, I can't seem to tell anybody about Jesus, and my wife can't stop. It's a process. It's God's working things out. It doesn't mean it's not going to happen. It's just he's not done with us yet. He's in the middle with us. He's in the middle with us. He's, he's actually in it to win it for us, with us, through us, around us. He's not stopping. And he who began a good work in you will complete. You are a work in progress. Don't beat yourself up. Just say yes. Just begin to say yes. The gospel in us just begins. It starts to change us when we say yes. It changes the way we think. It changes the way we speak. It changes the way we pray. And you know that God's working in you when people start to see Jesus through you, through those things that you say, through those things that you do, through the way that you sh you're sharing your faith. Sharing the gospel of Jesus and seeing people become fully devoted followers of Jesus is what New Song Church is all about. It's in our DNA. New Song, listen to me. I know you don't feel like a saint. I know you don't feel like a masterpiece, but God is working around you. He's working in you. It's working through you, and you're a work in progress. Would you stand with me, please? Every, everybody just take a moment and stand with me. Let's just build an altar to where, right where we are today, where we just make room for God, and we always ask this question, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today? Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today? Maybe for some of us, God's saying it's time to take your next step. It's time, it's time for you to take that next step, whatever it would be. To maybe it's water baptism, which we're gonna have when we can all get back together. Maybe it's growth track, which you can do right now. You can sign up for growth track. Maybe it's life group. Maybe it's dream team to be able to serve and find your purpose. It's, that's what we're all about: to know God, find freedom, discover your purpose, and make a difference. How? God, what are you saying to me? Maybe that's what that step is for you. And listen, we're in this together. We're in this together. So as the Holy Spirit begins to reveal to your heart what it is, just ask him, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Father, right now, Lord, I, I just lift up, Lord, those, Lord, who are just surrendering to you, God, and desiring to be more like you, Lord God, and understanding that it's a process. We thank you for the process. Lord, we can find joy, and, and, and we can thank you for the process. No matter where we are on this walk, Lord, you are moving, and you are working, and, and there's a wonderful, wonderful guarantee that you will complete, and you will finish everything that you stopped, God. May that bring joy and peace and comfort to every believer who's listening to this today, who doesn't feel like a masterpiece, who doesn't feel that much like a saint, Lord God. But Lord, I pray for every heart to be open and to say yes, to move forward, Lord God. That we would not move backwards, that we would not sit still, but we would move forward, surrendering that to you, Lord God. Come on, family, if that's you, just say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
I want to talk to you today if you've been listening and you've been watching and you are not in the family because you are not a member of the family because you don't know Jesus personally like the way we're talking. God's not at work in you, but he can be. Friend, he can be. Family, God can be at work in you. God wants to work in you. It brings him joy when you turn and you accept him as Lord and Savior, that free gift. He gives you peace. He gives you grace. You become his child. God's, God wants you to know how much he loves you. I want to pray right now for you. If that's you today, just say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sin. I turn to you. Help me, Lord God, to walk this process out, to say yes to you. I'm saying yes right now. Thank you for dying for me. I'll follow you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you just prayed that prayer, we just want to say welcome to the family. And listen, right after we're done here, you can go on our website, fill out the connection card. Let us know that you just prayed. If you're not from around our area, we will help you get connected to a church where you can grow and you can be, um, you, can, you can thrive. Because God is working through you and in you. So, we thank you. Now I'm going to ask Elise to come back and we're going to finish with this song and just celebrate what God's doing. He's with us in the midst of it. And uh, God bless you guys as we just sing this out. You can sing with us and, and uh, rejoice. There's another in the fire with us. I love that. And, and that's what we're, we're going to finish with. Thank you.